Hello there and welcome back to session number four of the Love of God teaching series. And the session today is entitled God's Dream for Man Part 2. And we saw in, the, in our last session, God's Dream for Man Part 1, how God gave a powerful promise in Genesis 3.15 that He would send a Savior, He would send a human being in the future who would make war with Satan and will deliver the human race from the control and dominion of sin. And beginning in Genesis 3.15, God uh, starts uh, looking for friends, searching for friends all over the Old Testament to fulfill his promise. And he finds Enoch first, and then Noah, and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then the whole people of Israel. And he passed down the blessing from Abraham to Isaac, to Jacob, to the people of Israel. And then he took by the hands the, the people of Israel from Egypt and delivered them. And they come into this the desert, and we see how God's dream for man in the whole Old Testament was to be with man, to dwell with man, to love man, to bless him, to give him success, victory, prosperity, and to do good to man. And we see, we left off at Zechariah, uh, where God is uh, coming through the fabric of time and announcing, shout for joy and rejoice that uh, I'm coming. The Lord is coming. The Savior is coming. Of course, nobody in that time rejoiced and sang, but the Lord nevertheless announced that Jesus is coming. So now we come to the New Testament and we'll, we'll try to go through the whole New Testament and see God's dream for men in the New Testament and how that dream unfolded how that promise was fulfilled and we see beginning in the gospel of john chapter 1 we see how jesus christ the person of wisdom the word who was from the beginning jesus christ comes to the earth on the earth and he becomes flesh let's start reading from john chapter 1 verse 1 i'll be reading from new king james version and you can read from whatever english translation you have available let's read it together in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the word was God. Let's pick it up in verse 14, the same chapter. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see God, if you remember from our last session, that the people of Israel got out of Egypt and came into the hot desert. And in that hot desert, the Lord God says, I want you to make me a tent. I want to leave heaven and be with you, dwell among you in the tent. And as a matter of fact, he dwelled in the cloud, as we know, in the tabernacle, in the Ark of the Covenant. The presence of the Lord was with the people of Israel. That was his dream, his desire. And now we see in the New Testament that uh, 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 he, he came to live among us, but in a different tent, not like the one in the Old Testament. He came to live in a different tent, which is our physical body. We see Jesus first taking the form of a human body, physical body. He became flesh and he came into a different tent. And we see this idea also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Apostle Paul says this, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So our physical body is a tent, is a different tent, is the temple of the Holy Spirit we'll see later on in, this, in, the, in our sessions. Our physical body is the tent in which the Lord comes to dwell in the New Testament. Let's open also 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. So the Lord God comes into the person of Jesus into our tent he becomes a human he becomes flesh the word of god the person of wisdom becomes flesh and he comes on the earth he with a certain purpose in mind let's see what that purpose is in matthew chapter 22 verse 1 to 2 and jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son now let's see in this short passage, who is the king, who is the son, and who is the bride? 
The king is, of course, who? The Father God. Who is the Son? The Son is Jesus Christ. We know from the New Testament. And Jesus Christ wants to marry who? Us, the church, people, human race. Because why? We saw in session two and session three that we, the humans, the sons of men, are his delight. Jesus was and is God's delight. He is God's beloved son. But we humans are Jesus' delight. We are Jesus' pleasure. And Jesus came to marry us. Uh, and the king, Father God, arranged a marriage for, for his son. So Jesus came on the earth with a purpose to get married to the church. And before getting married, as we know, any man needs to propose his wife first, right? And Jesus did the same thing. He proposed to the church. Let's see how he did that. Let's open up Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 32. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Amen. We see so many wonderful things in this passage. We see at verse 31 that a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. They become one flesh. In other words, when a man marries a woman, his first priority becomes his wife, no longer his parents. He, he will continue, of course, any uh, good son will continue to respect his parents, but they are no longer his first priority. His wife becomes his priority because they, he leaves his parents and also the wife leaves her parents and they become one flesh. Their first priority is one for each other. So now we, we come and see the Apostle Paul saying in verse 32 that this is a great mystery and I speak concerning Christ and the church. What does he mean? For a long time, I haven't seen this idea, this uh, revelation. But Pastor Jerry, for his teaching, opened my eyes to see this a wonderful secret here, a wonderful revelation. That in the same way, a man leaves his father and mother and unites himself with his wife. In the same way, Jesus Christ left his father God and heaven and the glory and came and became one spirit with us the church the bible says at first corinthians 6 uh, verse 17 that he who unites himself with the lord becomes one spirit with the lord and it might be difficult for us to understand and even to grasp that we the church have become jesus christ first priority even before the father god it might be difficult to understand. That's why probably Apostle Paul says it's a, it's a great mystery because it's difficult to swallow that the church, Jesus Christ loves so much the church that he gave himself for the church. And this is the way that he proposed the church by sacrificing himself, by giving himself for the church to save the church and now the church has become his first priority even now when he is in heaven we are his priority we are his focus he became one spirit with us not one flesh but one spirit but the analogy is the same is exactly in the same way that a man becomes one flesh with his wife Jesus Christ became one spirit with the church and every person that gets born again that comes into the family of God in an instant they become one spirit 
with Jesus Christ, with the Lord. And this is so wonderful. We see that he is not only wanting to be with us, but he wants us to be him, to be with him and to be in him, to be one person, to be one mind. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.16 that we have the mind of Christ. That's not a me metaphor. This is something real. The mind of Christ became one with, the mind, with our mind. That's why we have the thoughts of Christ. That's why we can think like Christ. We can have the wisdom of Christ. We can speak wisdom because His mind is our mind and we became one. We are one and the same person. This is so wonderful. And here in the same passage, I want to say something to men who are married. It's something, it's a secret of marriage that I learned long time ago. That look at Jesus, because he loved the church, he gave himself for her. And even before we were born, says the Bible, before we knew we were sinners, Jesus Christ from Genesis 3.15 took the initiative to come and save us. Took the initiative to resolve the conflict, the tension. And I, what, I'm say, what am I saying? That in a marriage relationship, man, you are first and foremost responsible for your marriage. You are first and foremost responsible to take the initiative to resolve any conflict, any problem, even if it's not your fault, even if it's your wife's fault, <laughs> how uh, we think most of the time. It's your responsibility. If you want to follow Christ and love your wife as Jesus Christ loved the church, it's your responsibility to be a priest in the family, to pray for your family, to pray for your wife, to nourish your wife, to cherish your wife. Even when you feel like you don't like her or you don't have feelings anymore for her, even when there, there might be coldness in your relationship, ask the Holy Spirit to give you strength, to, to give you back the love, to give you back the feelings for your wife and take the initiative. Go talk to your wife. Uh, pray for her resolve the conflict and don't let it stay for long this is a secret that i learned and it did to me so much good because the holy spirit helped me to humble before and also uh, my wife as well i'm not saying my wife is, has also humbled so many times and we it, it's like a circle it's like um uh, uh the more i humble myself and i ask for forgiveness the more my wife will humble herself and ask for forgiveness whenever we have conflicts or problems. And the more my wife does that, the more I love her. And it's just a, a never-ending circle. The more I, I go towards my wife, she will come more towards me. And the more she comes towards me, I, I'm going more towards her. I wanted to mention this because this is something that will help you tremendously in your marriage relationship. And I hope you will not hate me for that. <laughs> Matthew, let's move on to Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. It says this, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So many Christians think that this parable uh, means, signifies the fact that whenever someone receives the Lord Jesus Christ in their life, they are, they are to sell everything and just uh, come to the Lord and sell all their property just to get Jesus. But let's take, a, let's take a closer look to this passage. In Matthew 13, 38, verse 38, if you read, it says, the field is the world. So it's not Jesus or heaven. And this is found in the context of an explanation of the parable of the wheat and tares. And we see in verse 38 that the field is the world. And if Jesus is the treasure, what, 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 is the, what are the fields? If, Jesus, if we think that Jesus is the treasure for which we sell everything to buy it, what are the fields? Is heaven? So are we buying heaven? If we sold all we had, could we buy heaven? Or could we buy Jesus? So it's not about that. So it doesn't mean that. It means that Jesus sold all that he had with the Father. He left everything that he had, his glory, his heaven, and bought the whole world, the whole field to get us, to get the church, to get us for himself, the church. So Jesus, the field is the world, and Jesus sold everything that he had, 
all that he had with the Father, left and bought the whole world with his own life. He bought us to get us the church. Let's continue reading at the, in the same chapter, Matthew verses 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. And 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Also about price and about sacrifice in Romans chapter, five, chapter 7 verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. And one last passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste, chaste virgin, cast virgin to Christ. Look what the word says here. I have betrothed you, the church, to one husband. You have become, once you come into Christ, you have become engaged to Christ. Not married yet but engaged so jesus proposes to the church and he comes on the earth to be married and how does he do that jesus proposes by dying jesus humbled himself and proposed to us the church by giving his life to the cross and let's read in philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to verse 8 apostle paul says this let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now let's talk a little bit. Why do men kneel before their wives? When they come and propose, they, put, they stand on their knee uh, below their wife and they ask for the hand of their wife. Why do they do that? Why, have you ever thought about this? Why do we do that? I did that and probably most men who proposed to their wives did that. And they came, prepared the ring and they asked for the hand. Because... When I do that, when I kneel before my wife and ask her to be my wife, my whole posture communicates to my wife something that I would be so honored. I'm humbling myself and I am the one who is honored and privileged if she would accept to be my wife. In other words, I'm not looking down on her, but I'm putting her higher. I'm putting her higher and saying to my wife, if you will accept to be my wife, I am the one privileged and honored for you to be my wife. It's not you who are blessed, but I am blessed. Uh, that's what the whole posture communicates. Communicates, And that I see my wife higher. How did we, and that's the same thing that Jesus did when he humbled himself and went to the cross and suffered all the mocking, all the beatings, all the, uh, um, all the pain on the cross being crucified. He humbled himself and proposed to the church I, uh, saying, I see you higher. I love you. I want to be with you. I am the one privileged. I am honored to be your husband and you to be my wife. So Jesus Christ loves us so much. We see his love all over. And he proposed to the church. How did we accept that proposal? We, the body of Christ, the church. We see in Romans 10 verses 9 to 10 how someone can accept Jesus' proposal. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let's see also Romans chapter 8 verses 16 to 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, I love this passage, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So what is the proposal? The gospel. 
is the proposal. When someone preaches the gospel to you that Jesus Christ came on the earth, died on the cross for our sins, and now we can have salvation by faith in Jesus and by receiving the Lord, as Romans 10 said, uh, by confessing with our mouth the Lord Jesus. That's the gospel, and the gospel is Jesus' proposal to us. And the way that the humans accept the proposal, when we accept the proposal, we become engaged. As I said, not married yet, but we become engaged. And how do we accept the proposal? As Romans 10 describes, we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. We say, Lord Jesus, from this point on, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Of my life. And then believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. You will be engaged to him. When we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and he is now the right hand of the Father, that's when we become righteousness. We become engaged with Jesus Christ. And now let's think about a little bit about heirs. The Romans 8, 16, 17 says that we become heirs, children of God. We become into God's household. We become adopted children. And because of that, we become heirs of everything that God has. Everything that God is. It says that we become heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Let me give you an example. What does it mean to have a joint bank account with my wife? In the United States, at least, it means this. That my wife's name is on the same account with me and she has the same access to money, to the accounts exactly like me. And if she wants, she can spend everything that is in the bank account. She can spend all the money that is in the bank account. In other words, both of us, we have access, full access, to, the whole, to all the bank accounts and we can do whatever we want. So joint heir with Christ now, it means that everything that Christ has, we the church have. have. We the church have. Everything that Christ is, we the church are. The Bible says that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. We are seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says that anything is possible to, uh, to us in Christ Jesus. We have the mind of Christ. We are one spirit with Christ. We can do the works that Jesus Christ did and even greater works. So because that, all that is because we have become joint heirs with Christ. And the earth, says the Bible, the whole world, says Apostle Paul, belongs to us. Life and death belongs to us. All things present and future belong to us. And another, word, another place in Ephesians says that all things are under our feet, under the church's feet, because the church is Jesus Christ's body, and all things are under His feet, which are, which are the church's feet. This is amazing. This is extraordinary that we are joined. Heirs. And if you want, uh, probably at the end, I think we'll memorize this passage that we are joint heir with Christ, joint heirs. Let's continue our reading in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is again a powerful, a powerful passage. What does it say? Here, as we saw in the previous session, it's not talking about heaven. It's talking about the place of Christ because it's written before Jesus Christ went to the cross, not before he was ascended. So Jesus Christ says, I, I go to, to the cross to prepare a place for you in my father's ho household. There are so many places. God wants so, uh, so much his people to become his children. There are so many places for you, but I will come again from the dead. I will be resurrected and receive you to myself, receive you into Christ. So whenever Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, and then when we believe that he was raised from the dead, we come to himself, we come into Christ. So Christ is the place that Jesus Christ prepared for us. And where he is, we are also with him, as I mentioned pre previously. 
Now let's open a 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 verses 14 to 18 and see that once we become engaged with Jesus Christ, we need to treat this engagement in a serious way as being a real one, not just something symbolic, but our engagement with Christ is a real one. Let's read it together, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Look again. See again the God's dream. I will be their God and they shall be my people. I will dwell in them. Not just with them, but in them. And them in me. Uh, verse 17. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Once you become engaged in, a, in the physical world, in our world, once, once you become engaged with your wife, with your future wife, with your lady, with your significant one, you start relating with the opposite sex in a different way. Isn't that right? You cannot afford as a man to start dating or courting or looking with uh, uh, different eyes to other women or to other girls. Some things change. And I want to give an example. For instance, when I was dating, I was engaged to my wife, Natalia. We were still apart. She was in Italy. I was in Romania. And we've been like that for almost two years. But once we become engaged, I was, I was preoccupied. I, I wanted to know where she is, with whom she is. And once I heard that she was led from church to, his, to her house. Of course, it was late in the evening. But she was led, she went together with a guy from the church, she went home. And I was like, who is this guy? What is his name? How come you just, the two of you go together at home? So I was, I wanted to know, who, who is this guy? I mean, did you tell her? Did you tell him about us? I mean, we are engaged. I mean, you cannot just afford to go with someone. But I should be thankful to that guy because it was late in the evening and she was, he was actually doing doing me a service protecting my wife and taking her to to uh, her home and uh, of course she told me there was nothing there he wasn't interested and so on and so on but still i was like who is this guy and he was not the only one and maybe you were the same way once you became engaged you wanted your your girl your significant one to be only for yourself and in the same way jesus christ wants us to be only to belong only to himself so once we become saved, we become engaged with Him, we cannot afford to just live how we used to live. Look what the Bible says, to not touch unclean things, to, to, to become separate, separate from the world. Things that you used to, of course, we're not getting out of the world, but we, we are no longer doing the, some things, some sinful things that we are used to do. And now we are called to live in a manner worthy of our calling, to live in a manner worthy of Jesus Christ. And the Bible shows us what is that manner. How are we supposed to live? In holiness, in self-control, in love, in kindness, in goodness, in mercy. All the fruits of the Holy Spirit in, uh, in faith. So we are called to walk in a manner and treat this engagement in a serious way, like a real engagement. Uh, usually this passage is used when, whenever someone wants to marry a Christian, a guy or a girl wants to engage, get engaged or marry an unbeliever, girl or, uh, or man. And it's true because if you are not married yet and you want to marry someone from, from that is not yet in a relationship with Christ, there is a big difference. You are, you are in different kingdoms. You have different principles of life. You have different mentality, different philosophies. You don't do certain things that the, the world does and so on and so on. So if you want to marry someone that is not yet in the kingdom of God, you will have a lot of, a, a lot of trials, a lot of conflicts, a lot of tensions. Um, and the Bible advises, if possible, not to do that. If you are already married, 
the Bible doesn't tell you to divorce or just leave his wife. You can your wife. You can continue to live with your wife or with your, with your husband, unless you want to get out or the the your husband or your wife wants you to uh, get separated. But now let's come back to our session. Now are you you are engaged? We found out that we are engaged to Jesus Christ. But are we ready for the wedding? When is that wedding going to happen? Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 9. And it says this, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true saints sayings of God. So we see Apostle John seeing a vision here of what is going to happen at the end of the age when the marriage of the Lamb will take place. And who is getting married? Jesus Christ the Lamb and us, the church. We are now engaged, but at the end of the age we are getting married. And God tells him to write this down in the middle of this vision. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. If out of 7.5 billion people on this earth, you had the honor to be called and to be at the supper of this marriage supper with the Lamb and to be invited, you received the invitation to this marriage and you accepted it and you are there, you are blessed. In other words, that's what the Lord says to John, tells John to write. Anyone who accepted that invitation is blessed. Why is that? It's not only because, because you missed hell, but it, if you came in union with the Son of God and His love for you, you are blessed because you will be an eternity with the Son of God, with His love. You are blessed for eternity. And, I, and so many Christians and preachers focus on, uh, when they preach the gospel, they focus on hell and how to miss hell, how to escape from hell and how to accept the gospel and come to Jesus Christ out of fear of hell and not, that's not the reason that we should accept the gospel we should accept jesus christ as our savior not to escape hell but because of his love for us the focus is not the negative one to get get out of hell but the focus is his love for us we will be in eternity with him we'll enjoy his love his presence his person and that's the real reason for accepting him into our lives because He loved us. He wants to be with us. And He wants us to be with Him. That's the gospel. It's a gospel of love. The missing hell and escaping hell, it's a byproduct. It's something secondary. It's not primary. So whenever I hear in the funerals, people uh, threatening, preachers threatening people with, uh, with hell, that's not the gospel. That's not the right way to put it. We should not threaten people to come to, the, to Jesus out of fear but out of love. Fear is never a good motivation. It's, it's never producing on a long-term results. Only love, says the Bible in 1 Corinthians 13, that love, now these three abide, love, faith, and hope, but the most powerful of them is love. Love always prevails. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. Fear will never produce results. Fear will never change you, but love, is the one changing a person. Let's continue the reading in Revelation 21 verses 22 to 5. 21 verse 2 to 5. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Again, we see the same motive, the same thing at the end of the Bible in Revelation. God himself will be with them and be their God. This is his dream. Verse 4. 
and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And let's wrap this session up with a, a last passage from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. Again, because of his great love for, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. See how beautiful words, his kindness toward us. Because of his great love that he loved us. In another place says he lavished us with his love, with his grace. He made us sit together. Right now we sit, right now we are in the same position of authority as Jesus Christ in the invisible realm, in the heavenly places. We sit together. We are the right hand of the Father on this earth. We are the right hand of God, of power on this earth. Because we, are, we have the same position, we have the same seat, the same authority of Jesus Christ. And right now we are to show uh, the exceeding riches of His grace, His kindness, His grace toward, toward other people through the Holy Spirit. Now God is showing to other people His grace and His love, His kindness towards other people. Never threaten again people with hell, but show them how much God loves them. And that's the thing that will turn their hearts toward God. Because that's how God works. That's how God is. God is love. Let's finish now with two, memorizing two more passages uh, from the Bible which are powerful. Romans, we'll read them first and then we'll personal, personalize them if we can. Romans 8 verses 16 to 17. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Let's personalize it. The spirit himself bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. And if child, then heir, heir of God and joint heir with Christ. If indeed I suffer with him that I may also be glorified together with him. And uh, the second passage for memorizing, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Let's personalize it. But God, who is rich in mercy, let's say it together, because of his great love with which he loved me, even when I was dead in trespasses, made me alive together with Christ. By grace I have been saved. Isn't that it makes a difference when you put it to your person, when you personalize the verse too? So we've, we've seen in this session how Jesus Christ in the New Testament came, became flesh. He came to get married to the church. He proposed to the church by dying on the cross. And when we accept his proposal, we come into Christ. And, at the, and once we come into Christ, we become engaged with Jesus Christ. And at the end of the age, we will celebrate the marriage of the Lamb. Amen.